Lovely. So yeah, welcome everyone to our new beginnings um, community call. And I feel before we start, I want to give a background on how this uh, started and highlight the amazing uh, connections that still happen even virtually throughout uh, our network. So basically it started with me uh, talking with Shaukat Ali, or I'm going to refer to him here in the call as Ali, um, who's based in Tanzania. Uh, Tanja at the moment, a coastal city, a small city uh, in Tanzania. And uh, he was excited to tell me about uh, some recent developments where they got listed on the MIT website as a Fab Lab. And that just includes a process of getting, I don't know, reviewed for certain tools and equipments and criteria. Um, and that was kind of a start of a plan that he hope is just uh, beginning to unfold of creating a Fab Lab in Tanja, but also uh, exploring possibilities of creating Tanja as a Fab City. And immediately that connected uh, in my head to another conversation I was having around the same time with Nauras, our gig member, uh, in, an old gig member who's based in Basra, Iraq, uh, where he was also telling me about a recent update of signing an MOU with um, the University of Basra in Iraq, uh, where they have agreed um, to have access to uh, quite a big real estate, let's say, and quite an impressive um, um, uh, space of land in the campus. Uh, so all of this was happening, and I was still having conversations with Omar about what it means to be a fab lab and what he has been doing uh, in the past years here in Egypt of establishing spaces, not just in Cairo, but around um, uh, Egypt, given all, you know, in rural areas, smaller cities and villages, or I don't know if it's villages, but like rural areas in Egypt and all um, the challenges that comes with this and uh, the introduction, not only of establishing the space, but introducing the culture around the Fab Lab and uh, the making culture. So somehow it just felt right. I mean, this is what I hope my role would be doing is to connect all three of you guys together in this call so that we can introduce this to the rest of the community, but also get to hear from you more in details and see what can, how can we support as a community and what can GIG do at this moment. So that was a long introduction. <laughs> I'm going to go straight uh, into it. I'm going to um, start by giving uh, the floor to Shaukat Ali since this is how it started. Um, so Shaukat, you have five to seven minutes to tell us all about everything that you'd hope to share with the community basically and tell us about the big plans you have for Tanja. All right, uh, thank you so much. It's, it's it's so amazing finally having this call. We've been discussing, talking and talking and discussing about having this discussion all together. And um, sometimes I still feel I'm living a dream, but. It's something as I see, see happening in fruition now, so it's quite exciting. Um, so long story short, um, Tanga is a, is a few kilometers, uh, not a few, 300 kilometers away from Dar es Salaam, which is the city, the busy city of Tanzania. Um, so it's, six, it's 300 kilometers up north, and it's a really nice place to be. It's like a little Zanzibar. I mean, it's a little like a getaway of its own. But um, it, it has its beautiful history. Once upon a time, during the early 1990s, uh, Tanga used to be the manufacturing hub of Tanzania. And obviously, as the business started migrating and moving away to Dar es Salaam, this region started falling behind, right? And um, early 2020, uh, late 2020s, I was introduced to this space and um, going through it, it was, I think during the later stages of the pandemic, it was a really quiet dead town and a small little region. And I was like, kind of surprised that, um, you know, there has to be some sort of movement of innovators or local makers. You know, I like street smart people seeing this. And I think maybe the timing wasn't just right, but um, early 2021, when things started kicking back into place, um, I started working, uh, just doing some small gigs with students from, from vocational schools, from secondary schools, and then spend some more time going to these little, what we call, um, in Swahili, they're called Vijiwe, basically like small stations of little makers who would be doing some wiring and soldering. I mean, and I started noticing there are a few of them popping up. And I asked them, like, did you guys have, have I worked with the things that I have worked with before? And they're like, no, we've just seen this in the movies and no, it's all like sorcery to us. It's all like high hey, tech and stuff. And I was like, you know what, I think with what I've been seeing, there's an opportunity to work with these people and give them the right technical knowledge and skills or the things that I had been exposed to for them to work with. 
And that's when I started, started the first makerspace in Tonga um, in a vocational school, which is obviously for high school kids. Um, and that makerspace um, brought the idea of doing something more than that. So the makerspace obviously has a few um, exciting stories. Like people started building these, you know, the uh, IoT based solutions, obviously to try training initially. I mean, you can imagine you're looking at, you're working with people who have little to no access to computers in the first place. You know, I started working with students in the higher vocational schools who had never used computers. In fact, for them, computer programming is like working with Microsoft Excel and, you know, Outlook or PowerPoint. And then if you ask about Python programming, they're like, what's that? You know, so this the whole journey began. And then suddenly I said, you know what, I want to set up the first um, fab lab in, in Tonga. So obviously with a few a few friends, um, got the right channels to get into this process, you know, took up a few machines, got a little bit of funding initially and got a few machines in place, got accredited by MIT, and now we have a first fab lab. But overall, the vision that we have is with all these all the success stories that we're building with these young entrepreneurs, young innovators in the community, we do see Tonga being the, the a new fab city of its own, where you can come in and the whole Shenzhen mindset or Shenzhen maker movement can actually be built here from ground zero. So our vision, hopefully, with everyone's support and obviously people who want to, what we want to work with together, want to collaborate 100%, we're, we're looking into that. We really want to see Tanga become the next Shenzhen again, where it was before, but a little more advanced, a little more industrialized as well. Yeah, so that's our vision in a nutshell. Incredible. Very exciting, I have to say. Like, really exciting, not just saying this. Um, Thank you so much, uh, Shaka Ali, for sharing. Actually, I also would like to welcome Nauras, who just made it to the call. So welcome, Nauras. Uh, and if you're ready, uh, just to let you know, I've made a, the introduction of why we're here together and the link between all three people located in different parts of the world. Um, and we're very happy that you were able to make it to the call. And maybe if you can talk, you can uh, unmute yourself and tell us more about uh, where is Science Camp Iraq now? What's the stance of this MOU memorandum of understanding that you guys have uh, have uh, signed with the university earlier this year? Hello, everybody. Nice to meet you again. Thank you very much, Fadia. Uh, actually, sorry for delay because I just find the link in email and join. Then, uh, yes, Science Camp is a maker space, innovation hub, and also the Iraqi Fab Lab. It's based in Basra, southern of Iraq. Uh, it is the only city on the sea, in the Arabian Gulf, in the north of the Arabian Gulf, and it is the third biggest oil reservation in the world. And it's about four and a half million population, not registered yet because of political issues. Also, it is in Middle East, in Middle East and one of the hottest spots from the temperature. We see it as an opportunity for green energy. And we, uh, as Iraqis, has about 85% uh, of, of the population are young. Uh, we have not that well, good educational process or apparatus. It's mainly about theoretical rather than practical. And there is a big gap between the, what we learn in school and universities and what type of uh, opportunities on the ground, especially in oil and gas sector. And also from the field we are working on as a makers, which is the industry, manufacturing products. Uh, Somebody tried to call in the wrong time. Sorry. Let me let me close it. Yes. Uh, yes. Nowadays, science camp, after 10 years of working on the ground, we learn a lot. We start with uh, technology, science, maker movement stuff, and ends with a wider vision about the economy, politics, and the human needs everywhere and how to fix it in local uh, aspects. I welcome Nowadays, very first uh, critic. 
Hello? Sorry. I, I think, Ricardo, you need to mute yourself. Sorry, okay. no. Okay. I was thinking somebody wanted to ask something. <laughs> okay. Uh, nowadays, we have a good opportunity by signing an agreement with the University of Basra. University of Basra, one of the universities in Basra. Uh, it's about STEM education and also the other part of education related to the humanitarian uh, related studies. It's about 66,000 students. So it's a huge uh, beneficiaries and targeted group for youth, well-educated and uh, STEM related maybe majority of them STEM related beneficiaries. So it is uh, put uh, a type of responsibility for us as a makers to provide this type of support to reduce the gap between the job, the educational uh, status and the job market, and also to retrieve the Iraqi innovation and industries. This agreement to provide us with access to the beneficiaries about 66,000 students uh, like a type of uh, administrative amendments from the university to make the students run through our project to complete their curriculum or to complete their graduation requirements. Also, they provide us with a space of land, a piece of land about 750 to 1,000 square meters to build an innovation hub, a fab lab, or any type of um, maker movement touch the university. Also, they have more than uh, 450 uh, donums, one donum about 2,050 square meters. So we are talking about a very huge area in the uh, main uh, university uh, map to uh, invest in, in new energy and modern agriculture or any type of industrial educational uh, production lines to make our project sustainable and to provide practical education and practical, uh, let's say, uh, industrial lifestyle or environment for a student to practice this type of uh, very practical uh, trainings, like internship and so on. Also, they provide us, or we ask them for their space for uh, aerospace research, if we want to make drones or something similar. And it's always, uh, there is an legal issue of uh, using drones or working on this technology. In this way, we solve it with the legislation from the university authority. Of course, as a science camp alone, we cannot do everything uh, by ourselves. So we are very open to not reinvent the wheel again, <laughs> as we are the Iraqis, we invent the wheel for the first time. But this time we want to make it with you all. Also, we as a maker movement, we have the know-how, we have the vision, and we have the diagnosis of issues in educational process and the vision about the scene of the job market. The university provide us with their beneficiaries, with the, uh, with the lands, with their resources, and also with the legislation to make our uh, activity possible. The third part we look for to complete the puzzle to make the running of the projects and make it scalable and applicable everywhere is the funding, how to secure funding for the projects in both the grants model or investment model, because we talk about how to be sustainable and make everything can run not only in the grant model, but also to be able to uh, be sustainable as we try to support students and graduate to be sustainable and get benefit from their skills, their education, and the job market. In the first place, we should ourselves be sustainable also. Sorry for the very diverse and uh, 
big project, but uh, I try to make it short and I'm very open for any question, suggestion, ideas, any type of collaboration. Thank you so much, Nauris. Maybe just a very quick question. When is uh, is this contract effective? Like uh, starting when will you need to start implementing this agreement between you and the university? Actually, from the time of signing it, we signed it several months ago and it is for five years and it's uh, automatically renewable unless one of the parties, Science Camp or the University of Basra, uh, think about to stop it. So it's immediately effective. Do you have like a timeline on when do you need to establish what? Is there any deadlines, any expectations? Actually, I'm starting in the project because I'm working on planning, communicating, networking, collecting information, many meetings, and of course, so we can assume it's begin. It, it, it's the project's already begin, but we need something on the ground especially after we get a type of funding to start building something like the main building of the innovation hub, or uh, nowadays they have uh, four production lines in the university, but it does not work since mm -hmm. the war in 2003. And they offer us to invest in these production lines to make them work again. So this is maybe somehow attractive for investors to join us. And I think in that point, it will be a significant milestone in the project as a start point. Maybe. Amazing. Very interesting points and so many questions that we will get back to later. And I want to highlight the word sustainability here and you mentioning not just funding, but also investments in investors. I think this is uh, really interesting uh, to think about. I'm going to give it over to Omar. Um, I want to thank you again for being here. Please um, share with us how did, how was it, first of all? Now, we have two amazing people going into a journey that you took some years ago. So maybe you can share with us how was that journey yeah. uh, and, and tell us more about what you've been doing and uh, your general um, feel on this. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Fabia. Okay, so... Uh... I'm Omar Safti, uh, aka uh, Safti for short. Um, I'm one of the co-founders and the managing director uh, for Sanatec. Uh, and personally, I can uh, refer to myself as a, a social uh, entrepreneur and uh, a maker uh, who's uh, on a mission of doing uh, the best I can or the best I could to make the world uh, a better place, even uh, if for only a few people. Um, so yeah. Um, Sanatec is a social enterprise uh, with a bold goal of democratizing the technical innovation and making it accessible for everyone, no matter the background, the social class, the gender, the race, or whatever. Um, we believe that uh, everyone should be able to access resources, tools, communities, etc., to be able to practice uh, innovation. And of course, uh, similarly to the most of the social enterprises uh, around the world, um, we struggle and face uh, the same main problem, uh, which balancing the impact and, and revenues. Uh, we're definitely an impact-driven and community-based organization, but uh, living in um, this crazy world right now, and especially in, in this part of the world that I come from, <laughs> We need to self-sustain our operations and we need to be able to generate revenues in a sustainable way because if you uh, if we are financially struggling in our day-to-day -day operations, we won't be able to build communities and actually donors will definitely have leverage on us uh, and leverage on what, all what we're doing, which will affect the quality uh, of the impact for what we're doing at the end of the day. So the story of uh, Sana'a Tech started with FabLab Egypt in 2012. Then we figured out things. Uh, and by 2016, we decided to establish Sana'a Tech uh, to act as the overarching umbrella for FabLab Egypt and other products such as Sana'a Academy and Make of Cairo. And through these diverse products, we provide a wide array of services and programs um, as a way to, to diversify our uh, revenue generating channels. Um, 
through our 11 year journey so far, we've supported more than 49 fab labs and maker spaces inside and outside Egypt. We'll get back to uh, this later. Uh, and we have now a network of almost 3,000 alumni from our different programs. And averagely, uh, we work with and support more than 25K beneficiaries every year through our network of six fab labs and maker maker spaces that are totally managed by us. And of course, the different programs and, and, and services. So, so again, uh, trying to diversify like our revenues as a social enterprise, all what we, uh, we're doing can fall like under two main categories. One is the grant funding model, which we're all familiar with. And the other category or the other model is the fee for service model. And actually we're trying even to mix these two models uh, where we capitalize and upsell the fee for service uh, model. So we upsell services even for donors and clients as an additional component to some of the programs that we are raising funds for. Um, so yeah, I, I think we are familiar with the um, the, the the grant funding uh, model, and 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 under this category, we have different programs for different ages and backgrounds. We have Maker Fair Cairo, which is a family friendly festival, and we have uh, Manchea 3.0 Club, which is a fully equipped community run maker space in the heart of one of the poorest slums in Cairo. We have Girls Make, and we have Maker Diploma, which is. A professional development career uh, career development program and we have a lot a lot uh, of uh, programs but for the services um actually in in some parts we're mostly similar to most of the maker spaces and the fab labs uh, around the world we have access uh, and on-demand fabrication services for the community and we of course we have like professional prototyping and product development services for industrial sectors and so on but one of the most uh, important and biggest revenue channels for us is the labs demonstration. That's how we call it. Um, and it has been like, um, actually, we never expected this, but yeah, as, as I mentioned, um, we, 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 when I, when I started to look, uh, back to the numbers and I tried to gather like, uh, all the statistics we have. We found out that we supported more than 49 acre spaces and fab labs in Egypt, in Kazakhstan, in Libya, in Saudi Arabia, in different parts of the world. Um, so mainly when we talk about the fab labs in installation services or, the, or the, 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 the installation services in general, because along the way, we figured out that we can also provide installation services for innovation labs that we uh, we, we, we necessarily uh, don't need to call them fab labs or maker spaces. Um, so we have like this fully pledged lab installation services where we provide uh, support in the different phases, starting from the consultation on, on, on the layout, uh, the consultation uh, on the requirements, the team, the equipment, the machine, the list of machines that the client or the donor or the community-based makerspace want to 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 uh, procure or to to uh, to get, um, and the second phase where comes the procurement services, so we can purchase the machines and equipment and tools and furniture and so on. Uh, additionally, we also offer the installation services where we set up like the facilities and equipment, and we even. Uh, provide services uh, for training programs, basic training programs for the staff to be able to operate the space and 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 um, and you know basically maintain the machines and the tools uh, inside the facility. And on top of that, we also provide management services, so we can get you know like contracted for a specific period of time to manage uh, this facility. Uh, until we have like a solid team and until we have like a solid vision to be able to uh, run the space like themselves after this. And actually, I'm not sure if um, um, we have the time for this, but we'll pick like, like, I think 10 seconds. Um, share the screen, uh, Fadia. Okay, yeah. So actually, um, this chart, I'm trying to, yeah. So this is chart. Um, actually, this is like the one I worked on uh, today. 
So this was fun uh, looking back at the numbers. So um, referring to the 49 makerspaces and fab labs supported uh, by us, we have this chart. So this gives us like, you know, a clear image for what's happening in, in Egypt. And I think it's somehow similar to, 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 the, to, the, the, to the whole region. So you, you can see like, you know, uh, there are like 20 or 23% uh, of the maker spaces are community-based. You can see incubators, you can see public innovation hub and so on. And the other uh, chart is, Okay, yes, this is like the other chart. The other chart is about where the funds come from. So, however, we have like 23% of, you know, community-based maker spaces, but it's only 6% of these maker spaces, which are community-based, are funded like self-funded from individuals or the community themselves. So most of the community maker spaces, for example, get their funds from public sectors or from the government and so on. And this reflects on the, what I mentioned, the leverage of, you know, sponsors and donors and everything, because if you're running a community based maker spaces, it will, you will be like stronger and you will be like, you have like a clearer vision if you, uh, if you, um, if you manage to, to, to self sustain your maker space, you know, self funding and, 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 and so on. So as you can see, you can, you can see the private sector going up all the way. Most of the community, most of the maker spaces and fab labs all over Egypt uh, are, are are private sector funded uh, as part of their CSR and social investment uh, efforts. You can see it on uh, government, and you can see NGO, uh, international development organization, and so on. So yeah, um, I think it was the, like um, uh, a very interesting and a very uh, fun journey. And uh, before I finish, um, I have like these reflections that I want to share with you uh, about our journey so far. Um, so I have like five main reflections. Uh, the first reflection is um, the localization and adaptation to local needs is a very important thing. A one size fits all approach is not effective at all in, in this diverse global environment. We learned that we must tailor our strategies and solutions to local needs. And this requires like a thorough assessment of the local context rather than simply, you know, copying and pasting methods that work elsewhere. Uh, the second reflection is um, impact driven work needs resilience. And um, it needs like always prioritizing impact over quick profits. I know it's like very hard, but this is the fact. You know, when quick expansion or immediate revenues might be tempting, it's 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 essential to maintain a focus uh, on long term impact and building resilient communities. Um, the third one is balancing like two way value quality versus quantity, and this is like a, a huge challenge that we uh, we face uh, while working with donors, especially uh, that most of the donors and most of the sponsors uh, will need like you know quality. Uh, quantity over quality because they have numbers to to achieve but this is this is how we this is not how we build communities so in our pursuit of expanding reach we must not compromise on the quality of our programs the value drive should be like two-way providing high quality uh, benefits while reaching more individuals and by the time we will be able to have like you know this golden uh, formula for for this the fourth one one is the financial sustainability. As I mentioned before, our ability to assist others is dependent on our own financial health. Uh, and it's also like a hard thing to, and a, a hard fact, but this is like, yeah, this is how it goes. So we must ensure like having all the sustainable resources of funding and managing them wisely for the intensity of, of impact. And the last reflection is the um, the importance of building networks and um, this is like one of the reasons behind why we are proud of being like part of gig or other networks and even i'm not talking about like global networks of innovation hubs but also it's crucial to expand reach and enabling others to do the same by fostering even local networks 
for, for your alumni, for your graduates, for your uh, beneficiaries, and for your local uh, partners. Uh, so that's it. I'm sorry that it took like uh, so long. No, please don't be sorry. That's such an amazing uh, intro. And it's just, it makes me think, where do we start, right? It's a, <laughs> it's really a discussion that I would say would not uh, end today in a 60 or even 90 minutes call. Uh, this could, um, I can see this also developing if we see the need for having each aspect tackled later on in different call if it's necessary. Um, I want to quickly, before I start on different elements to the discussion, I would like to welcome Fabian with us from Green Tech. Fabian is actually uh, working as part of the Make Consortium and working right now on a connecting uh, founders program. So like networking of founders in Europe and founders in Africa and different parts, I think Africa mainly. Um, so Fabian also, uh, maybe later on, if you would like to, to say something about this, um, Pradita, also, I feel like maybe you have something that you want uh, to add before we open the floor, basically, for the open discussion. Sure. Um, I, uh, am I audible? Yeah, okay. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Um, you know, all the three speakers, to all the spe three speakers, it was amazing and mot very, you know, um, I personally, it was very motivational for me to give a bit brief background. Um, I was working, uh, I've been working with Fab Lab Nepal for two, two and a half years. And then uh, recently, um, you know, I've been working on establishing, registering a new uh, NGO called Fab Foundation Nepal. So... Uh, you know, it's it's basically to get, you know, like, um, so basically Fa Foundation Nepal helps communities across the country, that is Nepal, to establish and operate maker spaces and fabrication laboratories um, uh, known as Fab Labs, maker spaces, basically to bring in together a vibrant network that fosters innovation and creativity. So the target is actually to focus around um, education, entrepreneurship, and community. So that's why I was like, you know, uh, relating to all the three speakers. And well, to be honest, I've got a, you know, I've got plenty of questions. Uh, um, but then I think because uh, with the time, uh, you know, um, with the time available with us, I would like to ask for maybe uh, a time or date to set up a meeting uh, indiv individually with three of you to basically understand more, you know, in STEM education, basically to open up uh, new uh, maker spaces and basically to, uh, let's say, you know, uh, I've worked, uh, my idea is to work in, you know, in STEM education. The other is also to uh, approach universities and to establish more maker spaces outside uh, the you know capital city so that means um it's like it's like something you know uh, i i mean i cannot express how how much this call has been helpful thank you so much fatia to to you know invite me here um so i think yeah uh, my well it's more like um not a question but uh you know like but a ask uh, of course uh, to all the three speakers when you know how how could we can get connect how can i reach out to you guys so that we could you know uh, discuss more in details um, and also ask you know particular questions that i've got for all the you know three different sectors um so yeah thank you Thank you, Perdita. I mean, this is exactly the point of what we try to make here. And it's a great way to maybe put a tiny bit of context before uh, we go ahead with the call today. Uh, and before I, I send it back to also to our speakers to kind of decide wh which aspect do we want to tackle. So uh, one of the things that was common, actually few things were common between everyone uh, speaking today, and that was um, the reaching out to the network, right? The the global innovation network, which is the most interesting part to me, because here we are. We're 
there are a few things starting. There's a lot of knowledge that exists within our community and maybe even more than knowledge, maybe connections and networks to, to, to all kinds of people and organizations that might be helpful at this stage. And the third thing was also uh, uh, talking about bringing over that power, that vibe that you know this this global innovation this gig vibe that we have over to the old three different cities i would say this was discussed at different occasions um so again there is a question of gatherings exchanges between members and residencies between members when it's needed at this time there's a question of funding and sustainability there is a question of uh starting you know, the technical aspect and, and everything that you guys have tackled today. I'm going to throw this back, uh, actually, maybe first hear from Anna, which is great, because uh, I was just about to uh, throw back this to everyone in the call. Anna, please. Thank you. Thank you, Fadia. Um, so it's it's not exactly a question. It's well, it's it's an open question that I want to, to throw out so people can think about it through the rest of this session. Um, something that Fadia and I discussed recently was that, um, so we have this ongoing series of community discussions about um, business models for maker spaces. I think some of you have uh, attended those, some of you have even spoken at, the, at some of those. Um, <laughs> Safdi, I'm looking at you. Um, and um, that series is going on until the end of the year. Um, so there's two episodes that we haven't finalized the topic for and Fadia and I discussed that it might be interesting to see what arose out of this discussion and whether there was a topic that we wanted to cover in one of those so I just wanted to mention that at this stage so that um, you can have it in your mind as you know if there's a, a topic relating to to the funding or the business models or the financial sustainability that could be something we pick up in one of those thanks absolutely and just to use this opportunity to say that tomorrow we have the next episode for the business model talk happening at three CST. Please come. We're going to be talking about plastic recycling at makerspaces as a form of generating income to these spaces. So I'm going to throw again what Anna said, but also maybe on a more broader sense. Where do we start? So where is your needs if we are talking to Shaukat Ali or Nauras? Where is when it's most pressing? Omar, please. Yes, actually, I wanted to to uh, to build on uh, what now is uh, mentioned about you know not reinventing the wheel because this is like a global uh, problem, and I feel that there is like an easy solution for this, but we we always like overthink uh, about how should we reach out for help, and we always lack the knowledge of. Um, um, of uh, the capabilities of of the partners that we we work with and we we meet like every day so um the the the, the one thing i'm suggesting is to have like this initiative that we might call like help a partner or something like this and we figure out a way to make it like you know regular and systematic maybe like in in a newsletter that uh, that is sent to the whole uh, community. I, actually, personally, I would like it to be more engaging. So I'm thinking about, you know, a Google document uh, that people can write down what they're thinking about. And we start with, you know, um, writing down what I'm really looking for now and I really need help with. And people can, you know, match themselves to this and we can leave comments to each other and, and so on. And I think the three of us, Shaukat, Norris, and, and I, are working like on, on, on different projects at the moment. And I really need help with, with, with some stuff. And um, I'm, I'm sure that there are like someone out there in the network can help me with this. So yeah, this is my suggestion. Incredible. That's Thank you so much for this suggestion. And it's really nice that we have also now Shaima with us from the communications team, because this is also part of what we try to do throughout those newsletters to report what our members are doing, right? But maybe also think of more interactive way, as you said, Almud, where people can collaborate together around certain uh, topics and needs. Um, I'm going to throw again back to Nauras or Shaukat Ali. Where would you like to start? Do you think from everything that's being said today, and, and let's just consider today's call as 
only the beginning, the start of something. Um, where is where is it most uh, pressing at the moment? Uh, well, I'll I, I just submit with you. Um, the problem with me, and I think the same thing that I think um, Omar mentioned, is that I've, I've been defined as um, a humanitarian technologist, right? I don't build to make money, sadly. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I just want to make the world a better place. Right? I don't mind if I have to sleep under a rug or anything, but as long as the people you work with are, are, are in a better position. And that's what I've been doing for the past, I think, since 2021, right? We offer free education services. Uh, we train people how to use machines. We, we teach, teach people how to use, you know, CNC, 3D printing, laser machines, and then make something out of it that they can take to the community and make a business or a service out of. Yeah, and, we, and we have done significantly well. But the only question I keep asking myself is until when will you keep doing that to help people, not knowing you're helping yourself or helping the entity itself? So sustainability is the biggest question we keep asking ourselves. That's number one. Um, number two, um, creating a well-defined system that people will be willing to pay for a service or a product is very essential. right? I mean, I think... Uh, Omar's situation or Nora's situation or our situation, it differs from place to place, right? I can come, I can come with a with the, the DIY um, tricycle that I built, electrical tricycle, right? And drive it around town like a madman and be like, oh, this is awesome. People with disabilities would love it. I'm like, exactly, you want to build it for them. And then when we mention the price, they're like, oh, it's too expensive, we can't afford it. I'm like, no, but there's a way of getting these things in your hand, right? Doesn't mean that you have to pay us the full amount of money one go. Creating a, a fair financial plan for them to be more accessible and affordable is essential. So I think even the region that I'm working in currently, it's a huge mindset change. I mean, you're looking at people, like I mentioned, right? Smartphones is now, okay, a fancy thing, but telling people that you're doing 3D printing and robotics, they're like, yo, this is sci-fi, sci-fi stuff. We watch this in the movies, not real, realistic, realistically. But showing them how they can work with these solutions or work with these machines to build things that can be meaningful to the communities is another thing as well. So. It involves a whole mindset change, which is not very easy. I mean, it's been three years, and this is my this is my almost yeah, almost my second year coming to an end, and I really haven't cracked that nut or the code to get these people to jump in on full board. Number two, um, number three, most importantly, is to have these um, exchange programs. I'm not saying we should have people from our from Tanzania going outside. I mean, not yet, but people from like like Omar and Norez and from the community as well. Like I think uh, Fabian or Anna would know as well that like, bringing in expertise like the way there was in Fab Lab Bhutan. Or the way people come in from different backgrounds or create like tailor-made solutions for the people by understanding what the actual problems are is essential. And then tomorrow, if people think that these skills are essentially what they would need, and obviously they would know that it has value, they wouldn't be willing, they won't be scared to pay, you know? So creating these kind of models, I think is very essential. For me, I'm, I'm still struggling where, you know, like I wanna be sustainable, but I also wanna help people and I don't wanna fall back as well, you know? So these are the kind of loops that we're currently playing around with. So I think the whole idea for this call would be essentially to create, I mean, a movement of sort where we can support each other among our experiences. Um, I'm not an expert, right? I'm just a guy who loves tinkering and breaking stuff and I just inspire the same bad habit to other people. And, and, it, and it's working really well so far. But now we have to think of the, real, the reality. The reality is you have to sustain yourself to make the impact carry on forward. So that's the biggest question that I have. I've been doing and people can see from our um, from our website and our reports that we do um, we are making impact but now how do we make sure that we are grounding ourselves and saying yeah we can continue the next three years without funding and I don't want to be a fund for a new or 100 percent I, I got some funding initially to kickstart my job and I'm happy with that but now I don't want to be fund dependent anymore I want to be able to say that yeah I can do it on my own so that's the overall objective I believe Incredible. I, I think we would all love and I, I mean, it's amazing that Anna is here with us because I think she of all people share the passion for finding and cracking that equation of how could we be sustainable, right, without having to depend on a funder. It's very interesting that we say this also today. I would love to share very quickly my experience from uh, Afri Labs in the last week, where I've talked to several makerspaces. And one thing that came, two points actually, uh, one that came from the R Labs in South Africa, where Rene, the co-founder or the founder of R Labs said, um, invest in your community, invest in your members, because when you invest in your members, it comes back to you. So maybe at the beginning, it will not be something that will 
you know, return will have an immediate return. But when your members are strong enough to start their own projects that drive income and drive sustainability and and you will be the first one to to take that benefit and be able to replicate it again and that kind of really I was like wow <laughs> you know what a mindset to think about um like so many times we're thinking right underneath our leg we say in Arabic so we look down you know and we're like oh but we need money right now so that you know we can do this or do that but sometimes um having the the privilege to to invest on on a longer term and building into that community can um, lead to other places. Um, Sharka, go ahead. Yeah, just just funny thing, right? When I came to Tanga in 2021, and as I showed these people on the roads, you can build some really cool, like you know, Bluetooth amplifier, like Bluetooth speakers for yourselves. They kind of built a name for me in town. So if everyone sees on the road, they call me Ali Roboti, like some, some weird name, like Ali Roboti, Ali Mchawi. Chawi means like a juju guy, juju magic guy. And I usually, I usually have, a, I've actually built an electric bike from scratch, right? So I keep showing them, hey, you know, you can build this. He's like, oh, this guy's got witchcraft. He's crazy. He's a white Indian, white, white Arab guy, dude. Like, this is something you should jump into and learn from. I'm like, yo, it's it's a funny vibe around town here sometimes. You know, but being, I mean, the good thing that I really appreciate about this is the connection that we have with the community. People are really to invest in you, but when it comes to monetary, is where the hesitant is. You know, so I just want, I just want to make sure that we we reach there where they say, you know what, I'm I'm paying for something that's valuable. I, I keep explaining them. I don't, I don't want money from my pocket. The money will be used for us to reinvest in our equipment, our facilities, and our resources to make our training better for you and provide you with more you know, opportunities altogether. So that's the whole vision. But yeah, man, Ali Robot is the name in town so far. So I just, I just heard it today. The guy goes, Ali Robot. I'm like, yo, what's up, man? He got scared. Yeah, kind of thing. Incredible. <laughs> I love that, Ali Robot. Um. I want to say this is open to everyone. Please, if you have questions, raise your hand. If you have comments, if you think that you can contribute to this discussion anyway, don't hesitate. And I feel also that I want to nudge Nowruz. What do you think? What's your stance on everything that's being said at the moment? Because I need you. I know that there you need at this moment to, to kind of take action in so many places regarding this new agreement with the university and uh, and you've talked specifically about the support that gig can provide. Mike, yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good. Uh, actually, I'm in a situation. I don't want to say I feel. No, it is not feeling. I feel. No, it's the situation right now. We all, as a makers, we have a very huge opportunity here in Basra with the University of Basra to prove our vision, our ideology, and uh, what we can do as a makers for long years. We talk and design and think about many solutions to change the mindset, especially of youth, and to improve the intervenural uh, ecosystem and this type of mindset. So I think a type, uh, it is a type of challenging for our mindset, for what we believe in and what we can do together. This is the situation now. So what we need or what I need to make it in this uh, uh, spot in the world, I think um, maybe two to three things I can uh, think about very urgent. Uh, the financial support to start everything, even the team, because after 10 years in science camp, we have a well-trained and skilled team. But of course, this team cannot stay in science camp forever if there is no project or salary to support. So they are nowadays work in many other private sector and oil and gas sector, but we can call them back again if we provide them with a contract to uh, make the work faster and professional. So the first point, let's say, it's the financial uh, power to uh, retrieve the team, not, not only science camp team, but also the gig community and everybody who can do something positive in this project. And it's also the second point, which is the, the team itself. So it's become like a one point. The other th thing we can think about is the technology import. Yes, we are makers, innovators. We have many ideas, 
but not every time we need to uh, reinvent every details in the project. Sometimes we want to start with uh, operating several production lines with the university to make it like a revenue stream, to make it like a small scale sustainability. After that, we can improve and develop our ideas and thoughts in designing the products or services. So yes, I can uh, mention with points, financial support, the team creation in the global aspects and also technology import. Thank you. Incredible. I'm gonna stop hijacking here and I would love to hear more from uh, our audience, their thoughts, if they have questions, ideas, please feel free to unmute yourself and talk. Hello. Hi, May. Go ahead, please. Hi, Sonia. Uh, can you hear me well? I'm just trying your earphones. So. Yes, perfect. <laughs> okay. Um, hello, everyone. It's amazing uh, to listen to you all and uh, see you all. Uh, I'm sorry that my camera is not working for uh, right now, but uh, but I'm 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 so uh, um, I got some energy from the passion that you were talking with, um, and congratulations all on the great work. Um, so, like while you were talking. Some of the few things like um, um, during my work with the maker spaces, I'm, I'm so happy to see Sophie here because we worked together uh, uh, for a while and uh, I consider him he's my mentor. Um, there are uh, worked with the diff with, with different different styles of projects, but but I guess in especially in the maker spaces, one of the things that I mentioned that that also can help um, in, in, in creating that impact or or even uh, that uh, sustainability model is that to, to know exactly what you want. We're all passionate about making the impact and and, and uh, about driving change and, and all of that. That's that's awesome. But it's also, it's really important to, uh, to at least choose a specific area, for example, to start with, define your objective uh, very clearly, uh, very strategically, uh, who do you want to work with? And I mean, it's like the target audience age. Are you working with universities? Are you working with uh, um, uh, technical education and workers? In the, or are you working with the industry? Or are you working with, with the schools or with the teachers? Um, public, public sector, private sector, or whatever. Um, I think this is really important because um, in this, I believe, the lies the, the key point of the balance uh, between the impact and uh, and also the sustainability, because we, when you know who you're working with and uh, and why you're working with them and on what you're working with them, it helps you uh, define what can be uh, my potential uh, business fundraising, for example, or like potential sustainability business models, uh, who I can partner up with, who I can um, you know. Um, do work with and so on. So it facilitates a lot of things. So one of the things that uh, really help uh, is to define exactly what do you want to do and uh, what sector do you want to work with. It's true that what maker spaces does is that can it can help can help everybody. Um, but it's good to start with as we as we say in the business like a line of business. Choose one and then be so good at and then you can expand. No one. Uh, no one tells you like this is gonna be forever. You're, you're, you can add, you can change, or whatever. But I think like as a starting point, you need to define one thing. Uh, it will help you to create focus, to create a position in the community, in the mindset, and so on. Um, so and 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 this is this comes like from looking looking into the community, looking into the needs of your country. Um, of even maybe uh, like taking doing a research of what is the the, the global um, uh, direction of the world where where is the focus of the the current uh, the current directions and so on and um, and 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 like start with something that is focused this is will help you so much uh, the second thing is that um, one of the things that created a, a huge impact also 
and created actually a community, a huge community. Um, it's the kind of programs that you offer. Um, it's definitely based on the, your target audience, but I believe the maker spaces is not just only for learning technical, but it provided a platform, as we said, like we're talking in the, in the global innovation gathering. So it provided a platform for a complete innovation and innovation, it's a, a well-rounded integrated thing. So I believe like um, one of the things that, that also helped uh, or I, I saw that created uh, a huge uh, a huge difference is to to try to create your activities and um, and programs and thinking around well-rounded skills. It's not about only technical. Technical is really important. That's true. Uh, but what do we do with the technical? Like try to uh, think with 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 your team. Uh, is that technology is tools but what we are aiming is what are we aiming to do with the tools so for example um that will drive you to make Masan, for example a program where you combine problem solving where you combine uh, the technical when you combine even like teaching teaching your students or your participants about business so you create that point that you said is uh you actually help them to create in their project uh, so I think like looking also to the type of activities uh, from this way, you don't have to be only technical or only projects. Um, it will also help with with them to be, you know, uh, uh, to create something uh, to create something new themselves. And you're also preparing them for whatever they do in the life. Like if they are in the university, this is the way that they're gonna be working with in, in projects, uh, in in work in general. Uh, if they are wanting to be an entrepreneurs and so on, and also the type of product. So like these are the two main things that also popped in my mind and I would love to share. Thank you so much, May, for sharing. It's worth noting also that May works for the Orange Digital Center in Egypt, where she's in charge of the Fab Labs. Do you call them Fab Labs or how do you call them? Yeah, in the Fab Lab and also uh, Safdi was working on it too. Amazing. Um, this has been really like really insightful discussion. Uh, I want to kind of recap a little bit before I think we're we're gonna come to an end uh, pretty soon. And I think this is really the start of what I'd hope would be other more uh, focused calls on certain elements. Uh, I wanna talk about, uh, uh, we talked today about finding a tool in between our members so that they can share when the, these kind of needs uh, come out and, and collaborate real time. A Google Doc seems like a very simple thing. I want to mention also that the database is, was meant to be like this, right? There is the question of what are your needs? But I feel like it's not very interactive. I understand this because it's uh, you just go in to see this this person's profile. You don't really expect um, that it's up to date, or I don't know. We can talk about this um, uh, later on. But I absolutely think uh, that it's a great idea to remain connected to members, and uh, the community call is one way to do that. And hopefully, we could maybe just start after this maybe a working group. This is one idea that I thought, create a what WhatsApp if it's needed so that uh, different members that are working uh, in the same area or are starting makerspaces can share their updates, share their news, and maybe more members can share resources. This is one thing that I think about. The second thing is the sustainability, which is very much understandable. And I think in the case of Notice, that's more uh, pressing at the moment. So fundraising for what you guys are trying to do. And I'm going to keep that highlighted um uh, for some time now uh the third thing i think um in the case um of of ali or shakat ali is is you know getting more understanding of how to change the culture and a mindset so it's not just about establishing the phys physical space excuse me but it also um understanding of the understanding of building a community around the space uh, itself, uh, itself and raising awareness about what the possibilities of that space could be. And I don't know why, but I know that Omar has done a lot of work 
around this. And he was one of the, the gig members that always talked to me from the start of our uh, us getting to know each other about the power of community, right? And the community that you've built around Sonatex. So maybe you want to share with us on this uh, at some point. And now that you guys are 10 years later, right? It's been 10 years since the establishment of Sonatex. So what, what, how, how does it look like? How long did it take to establish that community? Actually, uh, I think the journey never ends because <laughs> you figure out uh, that your requirements and the community's requirements uh, and needs change uh, along the way. And uh, actually, uh, we, we, we had these moments where we figured out that we built somehow a community that is not relevant to us at the moment. <laughs> And of course, it's it will be like a community that you will benefit from, and they will benefit from you. But you will your your roads will you know will 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 split at 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 the end of the day. So I think the journey never ends. But um, I refer to uh, to May's uh, words. Uh, I think in the past uh, three to four years specifically, uh, we figured out that the most effective way to build like. Um, um, a community that is two-way community because I'm sorry to say this, but you know the word community are somehow being uh, used a lot, and somehow it uh, it loses its sense and it loses its its uh, its its meaning. Uh, because I believe the community is a two-way thing. Um, you can't build a community where you benefit from them and they don't benefit from from you as an organization for example and you both need to be clear on what you guys benefit from each other from the beginning and to run like a community based initiative they need to have like power to steer and to guide you doing the things that they see um, right for them so you can't be the only one leading the community and say that it's it's a community based uh, thing. So in the past two, uh, three to four years, we figured out that the most effective way to build uh, this type of community is to focus on the programs that uh, deliver um, a real value for 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 the people you're looking for, and this is how you hook them up with you, and they they feel like uh, they are into it, and they feel like they're part of a bigger something. And you need to be, um, you need to have like a uh, prior, uh, even prior, like uh, going with this program, you need to have a vision on how to make this cycle uh, going, going for, for no end. So the educational programs for, for, for our case was like the best case scenario for building a community around us. When I was talking about the 3K alumni program, we take pride in saying that we have this flagship program called Maker Diploma. Maker Diploma has been running for seven years now, and it expanded in the last two years from only um, 24 uh, alumni in, in, in a per year. Now we're taking um, around 100 students per cycle, and we have two cycles per year. We take pride in saying that 100% of the instructors, full-timers and part-timers, are Maker Diploma alumni. Uh, and this is because this is not because we're good at it. This is because they they were dragged into this thing. They felt that they are indulged into something you know genuine. And they felt that they need to give back to the community. So for me, you can't force the people to be part of your community. You need to you know you need to think it like properly and you need to have like um, as, as I mentioned earlier, you need to have like thorough assessment for your local needs and for uh, for what you're looking for as an organization and what type of people you're looking for and how can you uh, envision or visualize these people participating in, in other activities after they, uh, they be part of, our, of your community. And then you leave things to happen as it happened. You don't uh, force things after this, and it's a matter of luck at the end. <laughs> because you might not succeed, and this is not like a bad thing. I attended this 
a seminar uh, two two weeks ago, and it was lovely about um, dying communities that helps other communities uh, uh, get alive. So you some some sometimes we need to compost communities and concepts and ideas to grow other communities with you know more maturity and more and clear vision and, and everything. So yeah, this is how I look at things. Wow, amazing. It's really, um, it's a talk that really has me inspired as so many of you guys have expressed. And it just opens up for so many possibilities and I'm ensure and make sure that we um, get the conversation going somehow i'll just have to think of the best formats uh i want to say one thing that was the aim of that call and i'd hope that we can close with it and i've seen it here in the comments also being mentioned is finding the uh, uh, the best uh pipeline as as shaukat ali has wrote it like the best way to remain connected even if it's the the starting group now and later on adding whoever uh, has something to to contribute how do you think it's best to keep you guys connected so you can take it forward and ensure that you can support each other and i can see that the support here today is coming with all kinds of ways so even if it's just good spirits and morals that's also absolutely needed in in this world right we all share the same struggles and sometimes it can feel alone from what i've heard from so many people so um how do we remain connected what do you guys suggest i guess for uh for what we have so far i guess the suggestion of sophie is a, is a good beginning uh and i think like uh, um while we do comments we can like write our emails for example uh, or sharing contacts or uh, something like that. Or maybe we can have like um, uh, a shared sheet uh, <clears throat> of uh, of like contacts and country, like the member, the country, the the contacts, um, the this one and the, with the with the document that uh, Sophie said, I I think that's a good uh, good start where we can uh, uh, put our connections together and and if we saw that. It's growing and uh, it get like more uh, diversified. Maybe like then we can think of something more like global and categorized and customized something like that. Uh, maybe like we can even do uh, something with tabs. Maybe like uh, something related to the community, something related to uh, uh, business models, something related to uh, activities. Maybe something like that it can have it can have like categories subcategories of if i need something related to the community and so on um i think so noted anna um yeah thanks and yeah building on what what may was saying um so, Fadius, I think earlier on in the call, you mentioned the idea of working groups, and I'm wondering about whether there's an appetite for um, a, a working group or some kind of ongoing gig discussion group around hub sustainability and business models um, in a, so the, the series of dis community discussions that we've been having have kind of, um, We've tried not to make to make them too webinary, like they are meant to be discussions, but there are still featured speakers. But I'm wondering about a working group that's maybe almost more like a community of peers that people can bring a challenge to um, for discussion or something like that. I mean, this is just some initial ideas, and we would need to talk about what it actually would look like and and you know what would be useful. But I just feel like there's something brewing in my mind or in that direction, so I wanted to mention it. It sounds really great. And I think that would have been the next suggestion also from my side. We do have working groups uh, that, you know, are working currently in gig in, 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 in different focus areas. Uh, my only question is the technical aspect. So we, we've been to elements like the matrix, uh, but from what I see, it's not very easily visited by people because they usually create the matrix, even though it's great and it's open source, but they usually create an account there so that they can access gig, right? So um, I'm still wondering about the effectivity of this. And sometimes I 
uh, lean more to maybe things that people use more frequently, like WhatsApp or whatever, even if they, you know, we have comments also over their privacy and all the issues. And I would love to always always advocate for open source, but I feel sometimes that the community is not quite there yet. Um, and I'm reading now what Alwan has wrote, gig body initiative where we pair interested people together. That sounds... Mm -hmm. Can actually, instead of me reading, maybe Omar, you can just tell us more about Yeah, sure. Because uh, for the body or the mate initiative, I've, uh, I think I've been uh, through a similar experiences in, in different communities. And actually, it works because if you have like someone energetic as Shaukat Ali, for example, and if you pair him with someone who's interested, he will definitely like get hooked up or she will get hooked up and they need, you know, they need just to, to meet, you know, once per month, two times per month over a coffee virtually or something like this. And even we can share like in, in, in our uh, monthly meetups, uh, gig monthly meetups, we can share like the results of, of these meetups or something like this. So uh, this is the first one. And as as Anna said, I'm I'm really interested in 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 and and actually I've talked to you about this uh, earlier about the smaller focus groups and actually I think the main problem is figuring out the topics or the themes of these focus groups. But what I had in mind is building up on this series of when we talked about the different business uh, models for maker spaces and the fab lab. It's actually the hottest topic out there now nowadays because we all want to be financially stable and sustainable when it comes to revenue generation so i think we have like these topics and themes for the different business models so for, for, for example if we create like a group for education so we can collect people together who is interested in education or having like programs uh, uh, under the education category. And actually you can be like uh, in different groups at the same moment and you can engage at this, you know, at one month and you can engage at, at another uh, group uh, in, in other months and, and, and this is it. And I think the third idea was, oh uh, yeah, um, I think we should figure out a way to encourage uh, the giggers uh, to work together. On Actually, I'm not sure if you remember this, but the first interaction with gig was uh, a proposal that we were writing together for the Islamic Bank. And actually, this is like the thing that got me hooked up with gig. And I liked like the open source concept and that we're working together in a document with just like met days ago and we're working on a proposal you know it was like an experience and i got introduced to two people and actually i learned things about how writing proposal to such organizations and everything so even if they're like demo projects we can work together on something for example i have this product in mind and i call for that who's interested in working with this on me and we can if this proposal goes on, we can replicate the same project in your country, for example. I'm not too sure how this should go, but you know, work can do it. They can he it can get us together. I can't agree more in, and specifically with this like more focused area working groups. This has been a topic for a while. Just so I get practical on this. If everyone in this call can give me one name of a prepared platform. Um, that they would see gig collaborating on for such projects. Just random. It doesn't mean we're going to use the platform. I just love to see what people would prefer using so that we could also make a sound decision. And this could be anything, right? WhatsApp, Slack, Microsoft Office, uh, working group. What, what do you use within your communities? What do you see is most effective? What have you been using so far? So you can please write it down in the chat. Perfect. Uh, I'm sorry, I will have to leave now.
because I have a, a work meeting, but it was uh, a pleasure meeting you on and uh, looking forward to meet you in you know, another call, inshallah. Thank you so much, May, for coming and see you in the next call. Yeah, actually, I have an uh, addition to the communication. Uh, yes, the digital world provide us with many platforms for that, and we will find a way to keep ourselves communicated, especially when we, when we work on a project together. I think every time we will use the suitable tool for communication. Like when we want to send contracts, some official stuff, it will be on email. And if we want to fast communication, we can use WhatsApp, Telegram, or so on. But the very important thing, I think we know we need to do uh, fast is the exchange program. I think if we spend several days traveling between each other to our spaces to take a look, because we will not see only the space, the tools, the machine, the community. You know, we will see and absorb more about the challenges of each country, about the mindset of population, how deal with the issues, how solve that issues, especially that related to the mindset, and how to deal with the officials or with the private sector, donors, everybody. So this type of communication uh, which is, I suggest, on the ground by exchange program, I think it's somehow important because we can read a lot uh, about ourselves and about everybody. But the depth of the learning process or how to get benefit from each uh, experiment and uh, situation, I think we need to spend some time traveling between each other I know it is somehow needs some technical support like the travel, lodging, visas, and this type of thing. But we, we, we are giggers. We are the people who succeed in that every year for 10 years now. So we will find a way also. So this is my suggestion. I am very eager to visit every space and to learn because uh, from my travels to Germany with giggers, uh, I learn many things and even my uh, my skills and how to see, how to understand is developed during these 10 years. At first, I was looking for the only very positive things related to the country I visit, or I uh, looking for the issues solved I still uh, suffer from in my country. Year by year, travel by travel, I understand more that we are all somehow facing issues and we have some weak and strength points. So this type of uh, skills and how to see, how to absorb, I think it's important to reapply again to our spaces to make it possible to communicate better and to know, uh, contact whom for which type of uh, task or job or project or challenge, who's the man or woman for that uh, situation. So I think we know each other as in a personal level, but as a spaces, let's make it for a spaces. I can't agree more notice with what you're saying. And uh, the I see here in the chat, the mention also of regional gatherings, you know, exactly for what you're saying, but maybe regional gatherings are more fast and, and, and have different purposes. But on the point of exchange between members, I just want to say that we do have a residency program, at least a pilot residency program that started under the MAKE project. And it has been uh, going since a year now. And there is a new round that's going to be introduced in the next month. And through this uh, residency program, makers from GIG are encouraged to apply so that they can go visit other makers uh, in, in Europe. So for now, it's unfortunately, it's only... Um, uh, tied to makers in Africa and Europe, but this is only a pilot. And what we're hoping to do is get a bigger funding and even separate independent funding that would allow us to fund a residency program just for giggers where 
exactly what you're saying, Nora, is where we can give the chance and the opportunity for gigas to visit each other with all kinds of purposes for exchange and learning. Uh, so I can't agree more. Maybe this is a call out in the last minutes, you know, also for people who think there are uh, kind of funders that would be um, eligible to fund this kind of project or this kind of program, please also reach out to me so that we could work on this um, in the next month, I hope. Um, so yeah, so this is what I want to say. In regional gathering, this was mentioned in the case of Tanzania. Uh, Rise Up Summit, Cairo Maker Fear, or similar event, we may arrange this type of communications. Like the, a big network of Maker Fears happens all the time, every yes. year, many cities. Also, uh, yes, this type of event may be like what we do with the Republic. Maybe also just using this point to be really practical and think small at the beginning. Uh, and using the fact that we have Shaima, our communication amazing person here, is that you can start by publishing the events that you're hosting on the gig calendar website, uh, on the, 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 gig, yeah, the gig calendar on the website. So you can do this through a link that maybe Shaima can share with us here. But I would really maybe make this call out on all giggers that are here and maybe later on on giggers in general, is that just by facilitating this kind of information, making this information visible for the network could open up so many possibilities already. Um, so maybe we can start with very simple idea of maybe every member taking it upon themselves to communicate to the rest of the network that they're having an event. And I mean this because, for example, Sonatec, we're having the amazing Cairo Maker Fair in the past couple of days. How many of you guys knew of that? Maybe it would have been possible for some of us to travel, you know, to Cairo um, had we known about this earlier, or even look into possibilities yes. of fun, or, you know, finding these kind of collaborations. So instead of putting things always on hold for for the big shot, big funding, la la la, maybe what we need is uh, is to start with the infrastructure that we have already and see where it can take us. Just. Anna. To Thanks. A point I wanted to make on the um, residencies and exchanges. Um, <coughs> Yuri Vlasyuk from Ukraine, who is a giga um, and who runs the Ukraine Makers Association, I know that he is looking up, looking into setting up programs um, for Ukrainian makers, and he's interested in you know exchanges so that Ukrainian makers can go to other spaces as well. And so um, he would be somebody to bring into that conversation too. Incredible. So That's maybe true. that maybe there should even be a, you know, a little working group on on exchanges that can both cover the gig program and and programs that gig members are running or thinking about running. I agree, Anna, and I think we need to talk again about our infrastructure and choice of platforms so that we can wrap this because this attempt was made some month ago, but I don't think was very successful on Matrix. So. We'll have some updates hopefully very soon. I think we're coming to an end of our call. This has been absolutely amazing. This is only the start, as I was saying. I will leave it to anyone to end the call the way they would like to end it. Um, yeah, who who's in for it? Who would like to send this away to the rest of our days, mornings, whatever? Enjoy the rest of your day, people. It's okay. been an amazing afternoon with you at my nine o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> so thank you very much, everyone, for being here. It's always lovely to check. And thank you, Anna and Fadja. All these business model talks and the collection of it online, it's such a grateful resource. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Talk to you later. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Fadia, for organizing. You. And thank you, Ricardo, for your send-off. <laughs> Guys, awesome. <laughs> Bye. Have a good day. Bye, guys. See ya. Thank you very much. Bye.